Well, good morning, Hills Baptist family and friends. It is Easter Sunday. We are so yeah. excited to have you with us here. We are celebrating our risen King Jesus. He is risen. Amen. He defeated death and the grave and is worthy yeah. of our praise this morning. So my name is Adam. And, and this I'm, is Nick. I'm Nick. And, and Nick, why don't before you get started into sure. our notices this morning, why don't you tell me how you celebrated <laughs> Easter this morning? Yeah, well, we were um, we went out for an Easter egg hunt with our son Josh, and we're not super keen on uh, introducing him to chocolate just yet. So we had these little egg canisters. Uh, they had all these healthy foods like raisins and blueberries oh, and wow. uh, bits of cereal. So you know, it's great. Like, cool. see how long that lasts. But yeah, see how long yeah. the motivation stays. Yeah, uh, uh, that's yeah. Great way to celebrate t uh, Easter. Um, but something else uh, related to kids. Uh, if you haven't already checked out the um, uh, the kids programs on the community pages, uh, they're there already. Um, you can probably uh, go check them out uh, after the service or this afternoon, and there's content there to take your kids through the Easter message and, um, yeah, involve them in our worship together. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and for those who've been uh, streaming and, and joining us online over the past few weeks, you would be aware that we are having Zoom community groups mm. um, after the service. So uh, every week we are gathering, we have leaders who will send out links to groups um, who will meet online. And we, it's just a chance for us to stay connected, to pray, to encourage each other uh, as the family. Mm. So if you are in one of those groups, because it is Easter Sunday, some are meeting and some might not be. So if you don't know already if you are or you're not, please reach out to your Zoom group leader and they'll be able to tell you if you're catching up after the service. Mm. That's right. Uh, and guys, just to let you know a few more changes to uh, this church schedule, um, uh, the staff and leadership have been reviewing uh, the current standards in uh, South Australia and particularly re related to churches. And we've uh, decided it's best that we continue with two services on a Sunday for our whole church community. Um, uh, and so that's going to involve uh, people from uh, all three congregations coming together to, to put on these two services in the morning at 10 and the evening at 6. And uh, we want to invite you, uh, everyone across our Hills community, to get on board and get around it. Uh, share these services so that we can get our message of hope in these dark times as far as possible. Because this world uh, definitely needs to, to hear hope and the hope that comes from Jesus. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and going on from that, some other things that have been happening uh, here at Hills is uh, we have a 40-day gospel reading challenge, which has been really, really exciting. Um, and so we're starting in Matthew and going all the way through the gospels. And we have had um, every day we've had a, a, a couple or a, a person from our congregation just sending in mm. themselves reading some scripture, encouraging us to sow, to get into the word and just, yeah, just share testimonies and how, um, yeah, reading through the gospels has been transforming our community um, as we've been, yeah, reading the truth about Jesus. So um, if you haven't checked them out already, please go back and look at the previous posts. They're on our Facebook page and stay tuned every day because we're going to still, um, mm. yeah, still be continuing with those this week. Yeah, it's so great uh, to see everyone. Uh, something else that's happening uh, starting this week on Thursday is the Thursday training at three or T3 as Dave likes to call it. Uh, so what we want to invest in our church community and equip each other um, to, to live out on mission uh, during this season. And so this week, we're going to start a four-week course on evangelism uh, and to help us think about how we do that in this season and, and how we go about doing that as Christians. And uh, I'll be leading that. Um, it'll be go for four weeks. It's, well, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited <laughs> about the content. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, invite you to join that. They'll be on our, our on, via Zoom and all the details will be sent out on our community groups about that. So we're going to come to a time of offering now. Mm. Um, we believe here at Hills that we have been blessed to be a blessing. So um, we understand that we're not meeting physically, but just because we're not physically meeting as our wider church does not by any means mean our vision and our mission and our values have changed. So we believe yeah. Yeah. that we want to see Jesus glorified, we want to see lives transformed and hope revealed. And giving and your offering and sowing generously into this church is just one of the ways that we can achieve that. So if you want to partner with us in that, we would love that. You'll see the details um, just below here. So, yeah, please take this time now to give, give generously for that vision and that mission here. Um, yeah, we can still be so effective even though we're not meeting together uh, in person. Amen. Guys, why don't I pray and then we'll hand over to the worship team so that we can worship together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. 
uh, not just the weather, but God, the day that you rose from the dead, that you conquered death once for all. And God, that gives us a hope uh, to look forward to, particularly in this season. And God, as we, as we, as we sing these songs, as we worship together from our homes, uh, as Mark comes to, to bring a message, uh, God, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would reveal yourself to us and that we'd, we'd walk away from, from this morning just absolutely confronted by your love for us, by your power to work in every situation, even this one we're in now. And God, we pray we would go up, go out and, and share that love, share that hope and, and live in that power, all for your glory, Jesus. So we pray uh, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, family. I invite you in this next song to really reflect on these words. I think this song is a beautiful song and I think it's because it really is an encouragement that Jesus walked before us, but he continues to walk with us. And in this season of change, he continues to walk with us and that there is healing in his hands. That's the message of Easter, that we are healed through him. So I invite you in your lounge rooms or wherever you are to worship this morning. Sing, there is a truth. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. You 
speak to the sea and you stand in the fire Gonna, just going to read from John chapter 20 before we go into this next song. Just about the, uh, the empty tomb. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark, and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple who Jesus loved. And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciples, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter, and came to the tomb first. And he stood, he stooped, stooping down, and looking in, saw the linen cloths laying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the the other disciples who came to the tomb first went in also, and he and he saw and believed. For as that as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. I just want to encourage you as we go into this next song to stand together in your living rooms. I know I was convicted to get out of bed last week and it felt really good too. So while we do miss coming here together and worshipping the Lord, um, yeah, let's just stand together at home, wherever we are. Let's lift his name because uh, we do know why that tomb is empty. And uh, we're going to hear about that today. So. We were awake without hope, without light. To from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
God's stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit stood outside by the tomb weeping as she wept she stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain then they said to her woman why are you weeping she said to them because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Jesus, she said, sorry, she said, Rab, Rabboni. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have said, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things to her. His name forever. 
to heaven's sweet embrace. I see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And don't death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you. And delivered and redeemed an eternal life is ours. And all praise His name forevermore. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. sweet embrace. I see scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face, and hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Father, we just thank you for that gift, that you have risen from the grave that you are the King of kings and that you have come to save us. And Father, we just pray that each one of us today will hear that message afresh and that we will really take it into our hearts and walk the rest of this week in our lives with that in our hearts, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to... Uh, be here worshipping and to know that you're part of it this morning as we join together on Easter Sunday. Happy Easter to you. I uh, hope that it's been a really special uh, weekend, a bit of a different one for many people. We have uh, in the Sanders household joined in with uh, what a lot of people are doing. We've been doing backyard camping, had a great night last night sitting around the fire, uh, cooking food over the fire and settling down into our tent for the evening. And uh, that was really good. I lasted till half past 12, and then I was out of there. I had a mosquito in the tent, and so that was tormenting me. Um, but uh, I really hope it's been a great Easter for you. Um, I was reflecting this week on uh, the privilege that it is for me to preach the gospel uh, week in and week out on a Sunday, uh, but especially the privilege of preaching the gospel on Easter Sunday. Um, just uh, as I prepared this week, I actually decided I'd read back through all the different sermons that I've preached on Easter Sundays through my ministry, right back from around 2008, right through to last year, preaching every single time on this Sunday. And as I just reflected on that, I just, I just rem was reminded that it is a privilege to declare the truth that Jesus is Lord and that He is risen. And if hopefully at home you can join in and say, He is risen indeed. You think about what, the great, what is the greatest day in history? What's the greatest day? Um, what are the great days that people remember from history? I think from my life I remember days like uh, when the Berlin Wall fell down. Uh, some of you further back will remember days like when man landed on the moon. Maybe if people are much older, you might remember back to the end of World War II when it was declared that war is over. You go right back through history, there's all of these significant days in history. But I want to say that this day, the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, is the greatest day in history and nothing comes close to it. 
This is a day that has changed more lives and has changed our world in a way that no other day in history has. And this morning, it is my great joy and great privilege to preach about why that is so. And so I reflected on uh, what I'm going to preach on. I was trying to think about what word captures Easter Sunday. What word captures Easter Sunday uh, more than any other? There's actually many words I could have preached on this morning. I could have preached on life. I could have preached on hope, and that'd be that'd capture Easter Sunday. Could have preached on salvation. Could have preached on freedom. Could have preached on joy. But there's one word that I kept coming back to uh, that I believe is actually brings all these together and describes the significance of Easter Sunday. And that word, as you can see, is the word eternity. Eternity. This morning I want to talk about eternity. Let me start with the story of a man who you may or may not have heard of, a man named Arthur Stace. Arthur Stace was a a man who was born in a Balmain slum in 1884. I'm pretty sure Balmain isn't a slum anymore. Born in Balmain in 1884. His father and his mother were alcoholics. He had two sisters and two brothers who also grew up to be alcoholics and lived most of their lives in and out of jail. He had basically no education. At the age of 12, he was made a ward of the state. Uh, His life as he grew up began to follow the same as his parents and his siblings. Alcohol abuse, petty crime, repeated time in prison. Stace went off to fight in World War I, uh, but when he returned, he returned to his old ways. He became a Christian in the most unusual way. It was in the middle of the Great Depression and he'd heard on the grapevine that a cup of tea and something to eat would be available at the church hall down the road And all you had to go do is go and listen to an hour and a half sermon and then you got some free food and drink. So if I preach for more than 30 minutes, just remember that. Um, So we went down and he sat there with 300 other struggling blokes listening to 90 minutes of preaching in the hope of getting a cup of tea and some rock cakes afterwards. But something in the message captured him and he became a Christian. He started attending the Burton Street Baptist Church where several months later he heard the great evangelist Reverend John Ridley preaching and Ridley was a a loud and passionate preacher and during his message he shouted out, I wish I could shout eternity through the streets of Sydney and he kept repeating himself and shouting eternity, eternity, eternity. And Stace left the church with the word eternity ringing in his ears. He was overcome by emotion and he began crying. And in his testimony, he says that he felt a powerful call from the Lord to write the word eternity. And he said this, he said, I had a piece of chalk in my pocket and I bent down and wrote it right there on the street. The funny thing is that before I wrote the word, I could hardly have spelled my own name. I had no schooling and I couldn't have spelt eternity for a hundred quid, but it came out smoothly and in beautiful copper plate script. I couldn't understand it then and I still can't. Stace had a mission. He He regarded his unique style of evangelism as a serious mission and every day from then on he would head out well before dawn to a different part of the city, a different street or railway station and he would just walk along And every hundred meters or so, he would bend down and write in the pavement that one single word, eternity. He did that for 37 years that followed. It is estimated that at most conservative estimates that he wrote the word eternity on the streets of Sydney at least 500,000 times. And in the year 2000, as some of you will remember, As they celebrated the new millennium, the end of a thousand years and the beginning of a new thousand years, and they thought, what are we going to do to capture this one moment in time after the end of all the fireworks, after the end of the most incredible fireworks display Sydney Harbour had ever seen? There appeared on the harbour, they'd thought about it for weeks, what are we going to do? For months they'd thought, what will capture this moment? And in the end, they came up with one single word that captured that moment, and that word was eternity. 
And I want to say this, the message of Easter is a message all about eternity. So let me pray and then we'll unpack the message of Easter, the message of eternity. Heavenly Father, I want to pray that you'll speak through your scriptures as I present them and through your word as I speak it. And I pray that you'll speak into our hearts this morning, that you will touch lives and that you will change lives. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Message of eternity uh, does not start with us. The message of eternity starts with God. Everything that we see and touch and feel is temporary. Everything. Even the mountains are temporary. Even the rocks, the most ancient rocks, are temporary. They had a point where they began. But God is different. Our God is eternal. Psalm 93 verse 2 says this, Your throne was established long ago, and you are from all eternity. And so because God is, ter- is eternal, God's character and nature is also eternal. And this is attested right through Scripture. In Psalm 136, we see over and over again repeated this phrase that declares that God's love is eternal. The first three verses start by saying this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, His love endures forever. And repeated through every one of the 26 verses of that psalm, we see this refrain again and again, His love endures forever forever God is eternal and God is love and the nature of God is that his love endures forever it is eternal in nature what great comfort is found in those words that his love endures forever not only is God eternal and his love endures forever but God's word is eternal Psalm 119 verse 89 says your word Lord is eternal it stands firm in the heavens. God's word is eternal. God's laws are eternal. Psalm 119 verse 160, your, all your words are true, all your righteous laws are eternal. God's love is eternal, his word is eternal, his laws are eternal and his kingdom is eternal. As it says in Daniel 4.3, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I thought about how do I describe the eternal nature of God beyond Scripture? You know, sometimes I want to give a, a metaphor or tell a story or say it's like this. And in the end, this is what I realized this week. There is no metaphor There is nothing that can be used to describe the eternal nature of God because God is unlike anyone or anything in his nature. He just simply is eternal. He is wholly other, immortal, invisible, all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere at all times and above all else, eternal. Eternity starts with God because God is eternal. That's point one. But here's where we come into the story. You see, the last two weeks I've preached from Ecclesiastes and I thought we're going to be leaving Ecclesiastes to move to the Easter message. And I finished last, my last message at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8. And then three verses on from that, it says this, that he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. What is that saying? What it's saying is this, that no one knows all of God's story. No one can tell everything about God. No one can fully grasp the mystery and the greatness and the power of God. And no one can understand right back to the beginning. And no one knows the full story right to the end. And yet God has done something because of his great love for us. He has set eternity in our hearts. And he has set the eternity in the hearts of every single person, which means me and you, no matter what your beliefs or your understanding about God this morning. He has set eternity in your heart. It is not surprising that every tribe, that every nation, that every people throughout history have come to understand that there must be something more than what we can feel and touch and see. 
that we're not just physical, that there is spiritual, that we're not just body, that there is a soul and there is a spirit. And this, this message of Scripture is saying, we know that because God has made it that way. He has said it in our hearts. You know, this, this week I was reminded of, um, of turtles, strangely enough, turtles. Um, you know a turtle, you probably know this story, it's quite incredible. A turtle hatches on a beach somewhere in the world. And then it immediately upon hatching heads to the water and sails off, doesn't sail off, it, it swims off, <laughs> it doesn't have a little boat, it swims off into the ocean and it spends the next couple of years travelling the world uh, and can go on multi-year journeys until the point where that turtle, when it's pregnant, knows that it needs to lay its eggs. And then from wherever it is on the entire globe, that same turtle will travel and will return to the exact same beach and the exact same part of that beach where it hatched and will lay its eggs. That's pretty amazing. It's as though what's happened is that something has been wired into the instinct and into the knowledge of that turtle to know that it must return to that place and that's what it does. In the same way, we have had something wired into our hearts that draws us to the reality there is something more. And there is something more. God has set eternity in our hearts. God has done that as a blessing and a gift to us because He wants us to know Him. He wants us to reach out to Him. He wants us to encounter Him. And so we sow on that seed. It's a little bit like um, when I was uh, a parent of younger children. And you know when you play hide and seek with really young kids? And uh, they're not very good at hide and seek, let's be honest. And so you don't, you don't go to extreme lengths with your hiding. Um, because if you're, if you're too well hidden, then they're just going to tire of the game really quickly. So you just do something really kind of pathetic where you just go and literally like kneel, crouch down behind a chair. And you just kind of, you're just there. And if they walk into the room and they miss you, then you start coughing or you call out. Because basically, you want to be found. And you play the game in such a way that you make sure you get found and then you're like, oh, you found me and well done, you're really clever, you've done it. And I think there's something about the way God has set eternity in our hearts in that He desires that we find Him. He actually wants to be known. He wants you to discover Him and He wants you to live in relationship with Him. So He sows it into our heart and humanity through history desires and seeks out and thinks there must be more. And the message of eternity, the message of Easter Sunday is that there is more. Not only do we find God, but He has reached out to us and made a way for us. And so point three is that Jesus has made a way for us to have eternal life. That's the message of the cross that we celebrated on Friday. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 to 8 says this, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Going back a couple of verses, Romans 5, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been made right in, in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Jesus himself made all these promises. He says in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. John 5, 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. John 6, 40, 
For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last days. John 10, 28. 28. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What incredible promises. And these promises we know are are certain and are sure and are true because of the message of the cross that Jesus gave his life. And on the cross of Calvary, bore our sin and paid a ransom for us that we might be forgiven and set free. Jesus Christ, a perfect sacrifice for us. Jesus has made a way for us to have eternal life. Point number four is this, that Jesus' resurrection give us, gives us the sure and certain hope of eternity. Now, um, in, every, in every church, probably the same as every organization, there's, there's classic stories about something that happened in the past that everyone remembers. And in my previous church at uh, Unley Park Baptist, there was a story from before I was there that when I went there as a pastor, I had this story repeated over and over. And what happened was there was a, a church service one Sunday and the pastor, the senior pastor was up the front uh, preaching the message and he's preaching away and, and um, everyone's just sitting there obviously politely, quietly listening and he makes a point. And what they didn't realize is there was a visitor in the room who was sitting in the second back row. And after the pastor had made his first point in the sermon, this guy stood up and at the absolute top of his voice, he yelled these words, prove it. (laughs) And the whole church was like stunned. And uh, I I think the pastor said, uh, uh, sorry. And he shouted again, prove it and um, uh, what happened after that well I don't actually know because it was before I went to the church but anyway (laughs) very interesting moment everyone remembers this moment uh, when this guy stood up and said prove it and we hear about the resurrection of Jesus and I'm preaching it and maybe you are sitting at home and you're asking the question prove it what proof is there what evidence is there well, this is the evidence I can give you. There's, there's things that are obvious, obviously uh, evidence that I can talk about. The first is that Jesus' body was gone on Resurrection Sunday. The tomb was empty and his body was never found. And the authorities, surely the one thing that they needed to do was present and find the body of Jesus and say, well, here it is. You're going about saying that Jesus has risen from the dead and here is his body because he was crucified and he was buried and here's his body. But that never happened. Secondly, uh, the Gospels give testimony to the fact that Jesus appeared not just to the disciples, but to many people. In fact, in one occasion, it says that he appeared to 500 people and the Gospels were written in the lifetime of these people. And surely if this wasn't true, people would have simply said, well, hold on, that never happened. But even that, you could argue away and say, well, maybe that's not true. But there's something that is uh, absolutely undeniable I want to talk about that this morning and that's actually the change that happened in the lives of the disciples you see when Jesus was arrested it says all his disciples fled in fear and worry and panic and they when Jesus was crucified most of the disciples weren't there the one disciple that was there was with the women and they were devastated when Jesus was put in the tomb on that Friday and through Saturday and into the early hours of Sunday morning All the hopes of the disciples were completely dashed. All that they had believed in, all that they had lived for, all that they had thought was going to happen, had not happened. Jesus was dead. But when they saw Jesus resurrected, their lives were changed forever. From a defeated, fearful group of disciples who were running away and hiding, they suddenly became bold and passionate and strong and unrelenting in their message that Jesus had risen from the dead. And it says in Acts chapter 4 that when Peter and John were dragged before the authorities and they said, We've got to, we want you to stop, just stop 
teaching about the resurrection of Jesus, they said this, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't stop. Doesn't matter what you do to us, we're not going to stop because we've seen it and we've come to believe it and we cannot stop testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. And they continued to teach this message. And this message in in terms of uh, in this life gave them nothing other than grief and trials and persecution and torture. For proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, Peter, the Apostle Peter, was crucified in Rome in AD 66. He was crucified upside down at his request since he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. The Apostle Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross, which is why the Scottish flag as the patron saint of Scotland has the X on the, on the flag. Thomas died by being pierced through with the spears of four soldiers. Philip was cruelly tortured in and died in North Africa. James was clubbed and stoned to death. Matthias was burned to death. Every single disciple except John was martyred for their faith and every single disciple had the ability to avoid that death simply by denying the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you were living for a lie and perpetrating that something was not true, you might do it if it gained you something, if it benefited you something, but you don't live for a lie if it's going to lead to your persecution, your torture and your death, unless you are convinced that Jesus rose from the dead and that, this, that through him you have life in his name and that this life is temporary, but eternity is forever. They could not stop telling the story that Jesus had risen. Let me bring this message together with an old story that I've preached, I think, a couple of times in my ministry that I just, I wanted to preach this morning. It's a bit of a classic. And it's a story, um, it's a story about two men and, uh, and they go to a, a, an art gallery together. And one of the men, now this is the context of the story, one of the men is a chess champion. He's, a, he's an international chess champion. And they're walking through uh, the art gallery and they're looking at all the different paintings and they come to a, a room. And, uh, and the, the central artwork in this room, this huge canvas, is there's a painting. And it's a painting of two people playing a game of chess. And it's a game of chess between the devil and a king. And in the game of chess... The devil uh, is clearly winning the game and he's got a huge smug look on his face, a big smile on his face and the king is, is looking down and focusing because it's his turn and the, the name of the artwork was Checkmate. And so they, they looked at this painting and then one of the men wandered off but the man who was the chess champion, he just stayed at this painting, he kept looking at it, he kept studying it and the man came back and said, hey, can we, can we go to the next room? He said, no, I, I just want to... Just, just give me another minute. And he came back the second time and the man said, there is a problem with this painting. Well, we, we, need, to, we need to go and tell the, the artist who painted this, there is something wrong with this artwork. And they said, what are, you, what are you talking about? He said, I have been studying this artwork for the last 15 minutes and I am an international chess champion and there is a mistake with this artwork because this artwork is called Checkmate and I've studied it and, and yes, the devil looks like he is winning and he thinks that he has won, but I've been studying this painting and I have come to realize that this painting is wrong because the name Checkmate is incorrect because the king still has one last move. And you see, the story of Easter is this, that on a Friday, Jesus was, was, was betrayed and he was put in prison and he was tried and he was sentenced to be crucified and he carried his cross up to the hill of Calvary and there they pierced his hands and his feet with nails and they hung him on a cross and he spent the next few hours bleeding and dying and bearing the sin of the world on that cross and then at three o'clock in the afternoon he breathed his last breath and said it is finished and he died and they took him down from the cross and they put a spear in his side to ensure that he was genuinely dead. And then they put him in a tomb and they put a stone in front of that tomb and they walked away and they said, thank God 
we will never hear the name of Jesus spoken about again. And Jesus lay there in that tomb, dead and defeated through Friday and through Saturday. But on Sunday, the greatest event in history happened because Jesus stirred and breathed and stood up and he had been raised to life and he stepped out of that tomb because the king still had one last move. As it says in 2 Corinthians, therefore, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This morning my prayer is this that you will know the hope of the resurrection. That you will know the hope of the resurrection. No matter what your circumstance this morning, you have hope if you have faith in Jesus. This morning I want to pray that you will know the joy of the resurrection. You know, there's people around the world who are suffering and grieving right now. And there's people around the world who are, are struggling in Australia right now with many different things. But I want to pray that you will know that in all circumstances, even in the most difficult, there is a seed of hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to pray that you'll live with resurrection purpose. Because, you know, the resurrection isn't just a, a ticket to heaven when you have faith in Jesus, but it actually infuses meaning in every single part of life because all of life is put in its proper context. And I'll pray that you will know the hope of Jesus, the joy of the resurrection and the purpose of the resurrection. But I want to pray especially for anyone right now who's listening to this message who has never put their trust in Jesus. I'll remind you, he has set eternity in your heart. And Jesus stands in the door and knocks. It says in Scripture, See, I stand at the door and knock, and anyone who opens the door, I will come in and I will be part of their life. Jesus says, I want to be part of your life. Would you open your life to me? See, the beauty of the resurrection is actually Christianity is not about believing a theology or agreeing to a philosophy or living by a set of rules. It's about encountering a risen Savior. And Jesus isn't making it hard to find him. This morning he's made it easy. All you've got to do is say this, Jesus, would you forgive me? Jesus, I want to put my trust in you. Jesus, I want to believe in you and I want to follow you. Come into my life and he will do a work and save you this very Easter Sunday morning. Our God is eternal. God has set eternity in your heart. Jesus has made a way to eternal life and the resurrection gives us the sure and certain hope of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray as the band comes up to lead us out this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of grace, a God of mercy and a God of love. And we thank you that you are the eternal God. Everything that we can build our life on other than you is temporary. But you are the solid rock. And you are an anchor for our souls. Strong, secure, and certain. And I pray that every single person across Adelaide, across Australia, across the world, wherever people have tuned in from, listening to this message, might just take hold of afresh the hope of the resurrection the joy of the resurrection, the certainty of the resurrection. Thank you that you set eternity in our hearts. Thank you that it's all about eternity, that this life is but a moment. Eternity is forever. May we live with that perspective. In your grace, with your love, walking side by side with the Saviour, knowing His presence, His power, His promises. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of Kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Let's sing it again. And oh, death, where is your sting? No fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, and eternal life is ours. And oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. has risen from the dead. What a powerful message of, of about eternity this morning. Uh, thanks, Mark, so much uh, for that. Um, if, if something was raised today that you want to chat more about, uh, please send us a message um, to either our Allgate or Verdun Facebook pages or uh, connect with us. There's the Connect link in the description of this video. Uh, we also have a guest Zoom account, so you can uh, join us and talk to one of the pastors, uh, and we can we can tell you more about uh, the resurrection and about eternity, about God's love for you. So jump on to there. Uh, but for everyone else, you might be uh, jumping off to your own Zoom groups or um, celebrating uh, Easter uh, with a lunch or whatever, guys. Go out in the power of the resurrection, knowing that our hope is sure. Our hope is sure, and we have eternity in our hearts. We have eternity to look forward to with our risen Lord Jesus. Guys, have a great week and a fantastic Easter.